perhaps uh, fitting, uh, although we didn't plan it this way, uh, that uh, our event today on Palestinian political movements in Israel and Israeli repression uh, happens on uh, the day that Israelis celebrate uh, Independence Day, um, uh, which is a period where Palestinians uh, commemorate the destruction of uh, much of Palestinian society within uh, historic uh, Palestine. Uh, and those uh, Palestinians living within Israel today um, mark this period with a special significance uh, as they uh, remember the Nakba or the catastrophe uh, when other Israeli citizens around them uh, are celebrating um, the uh, independence within their own uh, narrative. Um, so we're glad to have today uh, the Secretary General of the National Democratic Assembly, a major Palestinian uh, political movement within Israel among the Arab citizens of Israel, uh, Awad Abdel Fattah, uh, who will be uh, speaking on the Palestinian political movements, uh, Israeli repression, uh, how these, um, these movements have uh, changed over recent years uh, since the uh, Intifada, what kind of relationship they have uh, with the uh, Jewish state, the uh, number of different initiatives taken by the state to target these movements uh, and the minority that they represent uh, within the state and also discuss what possible impact the recent Arab revolutions will have on uh, the Palestinian cause uh, and the national and democratic struggle. Uh, so with that, I'm glad to welcome uh, Awad Abdel Fattah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, the, uh, my uh, presentation today will be on the, about the Palestinians inside the Green Line. Uh, I will uh, relate to this issue as part of the uh, Palestinian problem and as part of the struggle, um, because uh, for many years, uh, this issue has been or had been taken out of the context of the general struggle in the Middle East. And i um, saying that because uh, the Israeli policy has been changing dramatically toward this part of the Palestinian people. Originally, their policy was to weaken and control and contain them but now they are uh, shifting, this policy is shifting towards uh, stripping uh, the, their citizenship, stripping them of their citizenship, or even transferring them. So we are now at a new stage in Israel's policy towards this part of the Palestinian people. Of course, this is connected or has been connected with the recent developments uh, on the entire uh, arena of the conflict. Uh, the 1.35 th uh, uh, million Palestinian, Palestinians in Israel uh, and their role and the status had been uh, uh, overlooked or uh, underestimated uh, by the international and regional players in the conflict of the Middle East. Before the Intifada, I mean. I mean, after the outbreak of the Second Intifada and the extension of this Intifada inside the Green Line, to the Exit Line, I mean, people started to think or to know about the this part of the Palestinian people and uh, discriminatory policy that had been uh, pursued by the State of Israel or that has been pursued. And I would like to go back to the history of uh, this uh, minority, of this Arab minority, because we were not my minority but we became a minority as a result of the ethnic cleansing that was 
carried out by the Zionist movement. Uh, and you know that the Zionist movement from the very beginning faced uh, the demographic challenge in Palestine. It wanted to have a purely Jewish state. And they had to overcome this challenge. Uh, but in fact, they overcame it partially. How? By cleansing half of the Palestinian people. So uh, the state of Israel wanted from the very beginning a Jewish state. And at the same time, they wanted a democratic state. They wanted a Jewish democratic state. And we Palestinians were the victim of the Jewishness of the state and the democracy of the state of Israel. They wanted an electoral majority, of course, through blood, through shedding blood of the Palestinians. They wanted to cleanse them in order to have a majority, a Jewish majority, because they wanted support from the West. They wanted to prove that they had a civilizing mission, as if any settlement, settler movement in the world, colonial settler movement. So they uh, committed ethnic cleansing in order to, mean, to ensure that there is a Jewish majority, so that it would claim that Israel is a democratic state. There is minority and Jews, so they could pass laws in favor of the Jews. And which, of course, these laws, I mean, the privileges that are reserved for the Jews only. In 1948, why I'm saying that they overcame this partially because inside the Green Line, about 150,000 Palestinians remained there. And the state of Israel, the new state, did not like this fact that so many Palestinians, of course, there were not many, but they thought that there was so many Palestinians remained in the state of Israel. By the way, 80% of the Palestinians inside the Green Line, inside the state of Israel, were expelled. As also, as you know, the state of Israel occupied 22% of the lands designated for the Arab state uh, according to the partition plan, the UN partition plan. So the state of the, the, the new leaders of the, the leaders of the new state thought what to do. They were pondering what to do with those people, Palestinians, whether to go ahead with the ethnic cleansing or to maintain them. So it wasn't possible for the Jewish state to do what it had done before the establishment of the state because it already is a, a, a state which was declared by the UN, by the United Nations. So they thought that they should pursue a policy of marginalizing them, weakening them, and controlling them. But the, the idea of, or of, of expelling them was still there. But where they were waiting for the suitable conditions or circumstances, like in a, an event of war. And the massacre of the village of Kufr Qasim, the people from Kufr Qasim, 49 people which were killed in cold blood in 1956, this massacre was, in, was consistent with uh, Israel's policy to uh, intimidate the Palestinians and force them outside of Palestine. Of course, the Palestinians learned from the Nakba, and they did not leave despite this horrible massacre that was uh, carried out. The, the state of Israel pursued the policy of confiscating lands. They wanted, of course, to weaken the relation between the Palestinian farmer and his land, and to make, the, to change the Arab farmers into daily laborers in the Jewish uh, factories so that if they lose their economic independence, they would lose their economic political independence. Second, they uh, pursued a policy of denationalization. They aimed of engineering the 
the new young generation. They wanted the young generation to be loyal to the state of Israel. How they did that through uh, excluding the Palestinian narrative from the teaching curriculum. Teaching, a Zionist teaching curricula was imposed on the Arab schools. And any teacher defied this, this policy or this curriculum was fired. And I was one of the teachers who was fired and was arrested later. Because you have to teach this material. You have to persist on lying to your, to your students from 8 o'clock until 2 until afternoon. You have to tell them that nothing happened in 1948. What happened is that the Zionist movement came here and uh, modernized Palestine. And that's all. This is that. And that Palestinians who fled their country, they did that on orders of some Arab leaders. So the third thing that they did is imposing a martial role, rule on Palestinians from 1948 until 1966, during which movements, the movement of the Palestinians was restricted. Many farmers could not go to their lands, and they lost their land as a result. And they passed laws even, what they call that if you don't, for example, use your land for, for 15 years, you would lose that. And in fact, uh, most of the land that were confiscated uh, was in that period. So all this, these measures were part of a tight system of control that was implied by the state of Israel against the Palestinians. They wanted them to not to evolve into a national minority, to prevent them from acquiring, from demanding or struggling for equality. Of course, as the, by the way, in the first two decades, Palestinians did not call for equality. Most of the Palestinians, there were political uh, activists who, courageous political activists who, uh, I mean, operated or were active. But generally, I mean, Palestinians were preoccupied with their sheer survivor. They wanted to survive. They wanted to stay in their land because the specter of expulsion of this position and displacement was still hovering over their heads because they thought really that the state of Israel would expel them at any time. So they, so they did not, in fact, raise real demands for equality. They could not feel that they are part of the state of Israel because the state of Israel was still viewing them as a, f a fifth column or as a security risk that has to be contained. So, but of course, in the later, the after, and also at the same time, the Palestinian minority had to regenerate their leaderships because the Palestinians and Palestinian leadership was uh, uh, spilled outside Palestine. So. This was in the first two decades after the establishment of the State of Israel. After that, I mean, things were changing because of different uh, events. Uh, the war, 1967 war, uh, and because of, uh, and, 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 and by the way, the, after the 1967 war, uh, the world, especially the West, started to believe that Israel as a strongest state that it can be trusted and is not going to disappear. So they uh, sent more investments and more, I mean, investors came to the state of Israel. The economic situation developed and also the Arab Palestinians there inside the Green Line also benefited to some extent from that, that their economic situation developed relatively. So this also helped uh, uh, or this caused or produced uh, a high level of education among them. Of course, as a result, also political awareness developed among them. So uh, from that time, I mean, things uh, were became uh, uh, more, more political movements emerged. And some political movement started to, to, to focus on the, in, the issue of equality that they wanted to be equal. But nobody at the time specified what kind of equality, what kind of equality 
uh, what, what, what equality inside in the state of Israel. Until mid-90s, when a political party emerged called the National Democratic Party, which I represent, and said that, okay, the state of Israel wanted to be us citizens. They granted us citizenship in 1948, but this citizenship is, I mean, devoid of, 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 of its content. I mean, we just, we voted because more than 30 laws in the first two decades, 23 laws were passed, discriminatory laws. For example, the first law, first, the most discriminatory law is the right of return and the, the, the Huk Hashvut in Hebrew, they say, and the law of citizenship. Yeah, by the way, there are two layers of citizenship in the state of Israel. For example, the law of return makes immigration automatic for Jews, while it denies the right of the Palestinian, who is an Israeli citizen, to bring his relative from Lebanon or from Syria. And the land law, you can't have an access to more than 85 of the lands of the state of Israel. So far, the state of Israel has confiscated 93% of the lands. So you can't, you can't have access to this land. So some say that the state of Israel is an apartheid state. It's not only in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And so when the, when, the, when the political awareness was manifested in political parties, and new political parties, with new, poli new Palestinian intellectuals and leaders, they thought that we should direct our struggle against the entire system, the entire Zionist system, because the issue, equality, inequality in Israel is an ideology. To be, to be, for example, as a Palestinian, to be inferior to the to the, to the Jew, is an is an ideology. The ideology is Zionism, and Zionism and democracy can't go together. So we thought that equality can't be achieved unless there is. Uh, revocation of the Zionist character of the state of Israel. We thought that Arab minority must struggle for this purpose. Uh, we thought also that the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is the product of the, this Zionist, of this colonial regime. Because until recently, People thought, and Israel succeeded, in fact, to export this idea that occupation is a temporary arrangement. And if Israel was normal before, between 1948 and 1966, Israel was not normal at any time. Israel is a racist and apartheid state from the very beginning when it expelled half of the indigenous population and denied their right to citizenship, to come back and become citizens, this is an apartheid. This is the first apartheid law. This is segregation. This segregated half of the population, of the indigenous population. So, and Israel was imposed military rule in the Palestinians from 1948 to 1966. So, and in 1967, occupied the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So only seven months Israel was, if, if you can accept this idea was without a military rule. Only six months between 1966 and 1967. So Israel was never normal. So not only because also Israel is a Jewish state, it's not a Jewish Arab state, it's not a democratic state. And the world, the West, I mean the elites, the ruling elites, I'm not, I'm not saying the West when I say about the people, the civil society, I'm saying the, the ruling elites in the West continue to praise the state of Israel as the only democratic state in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the Middle East, when at the same time, where thousands, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who are the indigenous population of this country were subjected to a harsh, to, to harsh system of control. And Israel succeeded to conceal, to conceal the contradictions 
between uh, the Jewish state and democracy. So we thought that the source of that self, the self, the, 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 the source of discrimination and racism is rooted in Israel's self definitions as a Jewish state. And if we can, if you ignore, if you continue to ignore that, I don't think that we can reach to anywhere. So we have to redefine the state of Israel. And if the Israelis want to live and to exist, they should abandon their superiority. They should abandon their privileges. And the party, as I said, which emerged in 1995, uh, which called the National Democratic Assembly Party, said that, OK, we are citizens of the state of Israel. We want equality. This is our state. We want to reinvent this state, to democratize the state of Israel. But how? OK, we should abolish the Jewish character of the state of Israel. Okay, one would say, okay, what you, what you are saying? To, you, are, don't, you don't recognize the right of the Jews to have a Jewish state? But this, in fact, I'm not, we, when we say that, we are not questioning the fact that there is a majority in the state of Israel. There is a majority. There is a Jewish majority. But we mean that the privileges that are reserved for the Jews should be abolished. That's, this is what we want. But the one we will say, okay, if we achieve, one Israeli would say, if we embrace equality, full equality, then the state of Israel will crumble, will disappear. So what sort of the state, what sort of this, of this state that disappears if it embraces and implements a universal value which every human being, every normal human being believes in? Equality, justice. No discrimination between people, regardless of their race, sex, or, or nationality. So we, if they want, they didn't want, they didn't want to exist with the people. They are trying to get, to get rid of the people. And you, you, and you can watch that how the state of Israel in this, in, in last 10 years, in the last 10 years, they're trying to rebuild a Jewish fortress to get rid of many of as many Palestinians as possible and to get over to get uh, to, to, to take over as many lands as possible from the Palestinians and they are trying instead of responding to the positive to the positive peace initiatives by the Arabs and the Palestinians they are ignoring that they are trying to uh, isolate themselves in a fortress. And it is a great historical irony that Zionism, which wanted to tear down the ghettos in Europe, are now building the biggest fortress in Jewish history. And this is would not bring them security, the opposite. Because they think that they are now isolating the Palestinian people by carrying out the disengagement in Gaza, and sieging the area, and by building walls and electric, electric fences. They are, in fact, isolating themselves. So, so this is why I'm saying, because the state of Israel now, relating to the Palestinian and the West Bank and Gaza Strip and the Palestinian and the state of Israel as the same, was until recently, they were called Israeli Arabs by the government of Israel and its media. We are Israeli Arabs, but in, in last, the last, after the outbreak of the Intifada, after the, after the Palestinians started to raise the ceiling of their demands and to define, to redefine equality and to define, to, to demand justice. And so they are, the opposite, they are trying to, uh, they are working towards uh, isolating themselves. So, so uh, the response, uh, the state of Israel, as a result, as you said, they are, it seems that they have decided to uh, define, finally, the confines of the Jewish state. But they are building now an expanding Jewish state. They are taking lands also from the lands occupied in 67. 
besides the land. They wanted to move part of the Palestinians who are who holding Israeli citizenship to that Pantustan state. Of course, Israel doesn't want really an, an independent Palestinian state. Israel wants a Pantustan state. Israel did not refuse the one democratic state that was proposed by the Palestinian national movement in the 60s. Now they are rejecting the two-state solution. They didn't want both. They want to continue to dominate all of Palestine, all of the Palestinian people, and they think that they uh, they can they can uh, uh, convince the world to accept self autonomy for the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. But in fact, self autonomy applies to Palestinians. This should be the demand of the Palestinians or the right of the Palestinians inside the state of Israel because they are an Arab minority. They have the right to self autonomy. Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip uh, deserve an independent, a fully sovereign state. And in fact, they have left nothing. They have what the, the opposite, the state of Israel has built two states. There are now in Palestine two Jewish states. There is a Jewish state in the 1948 and a Jewish state in the West Bank. The settler state, they have different system. They are different from, the, uh, their rights are different from those of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So we have, and the, the virtual Palestinian state is embedded in the body of the Jewish state. We, no place is, no space is left enough for the, an, an, an independent Palestinian state. So this is why intellectuals within the Palestinian society and even uh, Israelis and uh, others started to argue or to debate the idea of one democratic state in Palestine where Jews and Arabs live together in full equality. This is, I mean, this debate is, is gaining momentum in, in recent years as a result of Israel's policy. It's right, I mean, this is a more and more just and more fairer, I mean, solution to the, to the, to the Palestinian problem and to the question of Palestine, to the question of the uh, Jews in Palestine, the, uh, Israel Jews, I mean. So the state of Israel, as you know, uh, is, is, is declared is the state uh, of, not only of the Jews in, in, in inside Israel, the state of the Jews all around the world. So, I mean, so what, Palestinians inside the Gaza should do in a view of what is happening now of the, the of the uh, development of the Israeli policy against the Palestinians inside the Green Line, and you know the Palestinian national movement ignored, in fact, not ignored, but because in, uh, after the Oslo Accords, the state of the Palestinian national movement thought that Palestinians in Israel are part of the Israeli of the Israeli state. This is not because that was the desire of the national uh, movement. It was because of the, it was a compliance with the desire of the state of Israel, because the state of Israel told Arafat that do don't touch this issue. This, these Arabs are ours, are our citizens. But we, so we were left as we are considered by the state of Israel as citizens but at the same time, they are not giving equality. They are not respecting their collective and individual rights. So they don't want the Palestinian national movement to intervene. They don't want the war to intervene. And some ambassadors, when we approach them, we say, OK, the state of Israel said that we shouldn't, we can't intervene in its own affairs. But it's, it seems, in view of the Arab revolution, that the world has, is using weapons, is using uh, airplanes against dictators. So, I mean, that's not a true. Because when Palestinian, even an Arab minority in the Jewish state, the Arab minority, is not protected by the state, I think the world should intervene. I think all people loving freedom, loving freedom or, or peace-loving people should intervene and should pressure the state of Israel because these people are not protected. They are discriminated on a daily basis. Their lands have been taken over. Uh, economic suffocation, settlements are built around the village, Arab towns and villages are separated from each other. I mean, there is a different, there is some, I mean, there is a system or apartheid regime inside the state of Israel is taking a new form. Of course, there are, there is debate or difference, difference, differences among, disagreements among those who probe 
the, 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 case, uh, the, the, the case of the Israeli occupation and the case of Israel compared to South Africa uh, during the apartheid. But some, Af uh, new, uh, uh, some ANC leaders thought that the state of Israel or the occupation is much worse than the apartheid regime. And this is true because the apartheid regime did not expel people from their lands. I'm not saying that apartheid was good. It was ruthless. But the occupation, the Israeli occupation, is more ruthless than the apartheid regime. So what Palestinians need inside the Green Line is that they want, they need that the world relate to them and cover them as part of, uh, as part of the problem and as part of the, of, of the solution. We shouldn't leave those under the mercy of the state of Israel. In the last five years only, tens of laws, racist laws, open, openly racist laws, are legislated against Palestinians, targeting their citizenship and targeting their lands. One of the lands, one of the laws regarding lands, uh, was the, the, the reform land, uh, to sell, selling off the property of the Palestinian refugees. Now it is, it's, I mean, the, 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 the lands of, of millions of refugees who, I mean, which were left behind inside, inside Palestine could be sold off. And of course, this is an order, this is a purpose. The purpose is to block uh, future restitution uh, claims by the Palestinians. So the state of Israel is behaving under the pressure of time. It wants to decide the battle and to end the conflict in the way it thinks it's good for it. For, 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 for it. But I don't think this is good for the state of Israel even. This really opens, uh, this is, uh, brings the area to the edge of, of more of, 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 of uh, uh, ruthless uh, wars and, 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 uh, and conflict. And if, you, if we don't relate to the Palestinians inside the Green Line also, also they, they will be a destabilizing factor in the future. Of course, I'm not saying that this is the most important segments among the Palestinian people. We, we, we look at all segments of the Palestinian people as one people, those who live inside Israel, those who live in the Kuwait territories, and those who are in exile. And the refugees are part of the Palestinians inside the Green Line. Because most of the refugees who are outside were, were, uh, were, are, 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 are originally residents and citizens of Palestine. And each of us, almost no family, no single family in the Galilee or the Triangle doesn't have a relative in, the, in, in, in Lebanon or in Syria or, or any other place. So these are citizens. Anyway, now Palestinians inside the Green Line are trying to uh, bring their case they have been trying, they have been working enough to bring their case to the United Nation. Because we don't see that the state of Israel is, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, would, 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 would listen now to the demands, the opposite. They are, they are pushing us towards confrontation uh, and we expect, and not only we, some even Israeli observers think that another intifada is coming, not only in the West Bank, also inside the Green Line. And they warn that if you don't respect the rights of the Palestinians inside the Green Line, they would, you would see uh, an intifada there, which would be more bloodier than, bloodier than, than the, the, the former one. And uh, in 2004, sorry, in 2000, the tens of thousands of Palestinians took to the streets and they clashed with the Israelis for four days, for four consecutive days. Thirteen Palestinians were killed and hundreds of others were injured. The Israelis used snipers to kill, to shoot leaders of the demonstrations. That would, well, that would not happen in a democratic state. That snipers used to kill leaders of the most peaceful demonstrators. So, this is the situation in general. 
uh, inside the green line and in, in, in general. So I think that uh, these points, are, or I hope that these points would be uh, taken into consideration. And of course, there are many uh, points and related to the issue that would be, I mean, would, uh, uh, address them uh, during the, the, the discussion or when you have questions. Thank you. I'd be happy to take your um, Q and A. Let's just uh, wait a moment. We can come up here in the meantime for Q and A. Let's just get the uh, microphone uh, ready and show of hands. Why don't we start right back here and just wait a moment till the microphone gets to you so we can we can hear you. Um, Dr. Abdel Fattah, I wanted to ask you about um, the BDS movement inside Israel, and could you comment on the prospects for the BDS movement inside Israel and worldwide to change Israel's behavior? Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, the BDS is very important. What it's doing is very important. And uh, we are following the Israeli newspapers. And what, do, do what the Israeli leaders say about that, they are very worried about that. Uh, recently, there is a study by a, st a center for strategic study uh, saying that uh, we, they should uh, view the digitalization campaign that is uh, being launched by the BDS and others uh, should be viewed as a strategic threat because you know the set of Israel thinks that Iran is a strategic threat the Arabs in Israel another strategic threat and the, the boycott campaign outside Israel is another threat this is recently what I, they are very worried about that it's very important I think that every uh, peace-loving uh, person or activists, I mean, can have role in this uh, battle. They can pressure the state of Israel. Uh, would, this would uh, bring results as uh, we, as, as with the uh, apartheid regime. So this is very important, I believe. Mm. Just one moment mm. for the Could you tell us about the effect of the uh, Arab Revolution on your condition, the recent Arab Revolution on your condition? Uh, yeah, the, the Arab revolutions uh, sweeping the, uh, now the streets of the Arab world is uh, of a great uh, importance. And no doubt that it will have a great impact, positive impact, on the course of the struggle of the Palestinians. But this will not be, I mean, uh, since now, uh, no doubt also for, uh, 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 first it, is, it would be, I mean, uh, at the, on the moral level. I mean, uh, the Palestinian as an Arab, as part of the Arab world, feel too uh, proud uh, and this would be this uh, pride the sense of a pride will be sooner or later will be translated into action uh, of course the uh, Palestinian Authority in Ramallah did not like the fact that for example the the, the Egyptian regime would be toppled because the, for for different reason you know but the people, the ordinary people, I mean, thought that it was very important, and they uh, tried to uh, sh to uh, act in solidarity with these revolutions and also to learn from it in order to uh, have uh, some kind of uh, massive uh, protest. But uh, some people are critical of the response of the Palestinians because they thought that uh, Palestinians would take to the streets uh, 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 and, and, and mount another intifada soon. 
but I think this is there are many objective obstacles before that, uh, mainly the uh, Oslo Accords and the commitments uh, towards Israel, the political regime existing there, the rift between Hamas and Fatah, all this uh, blocked the outbreak of another intifada. Uh, but uh, for Palestinians, we think, always we thought that if the regimes change in the Arab world, this would be of a great contribution to the Palestinian struggle because the Palestine, Palestine is part of the Arab world. The Palestinian cause is an Arab cause. And uh, now when, when regimes change, uh, I think uh, will be, uh, uh, will open a new chance uh, for uh, uh, other changes in regard of, uh, with regard to the, to the uh, conflict. But we don't know when. I'm not, I'm not saying that an intifada would, would happen tomorrow after tomorrow, but even the Israelis think that the Palestinians would, 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 would uh, go on uh, an intifada or something like that because the current government in Israel is not uh, uh, doing anything to prevent that. One moment. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Um, Israel always says that you know it's the only democracy in the Middle East, and uh, apparently citizens, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, are not treated equally in all respects. And I'd like to know if you could mention some specific examples of that. As far as I know, all you know is that they don't serve in the IDF. But could you address that? You mean uh, specific yeah, examples how, of discrimination? How, I'm sorry. Specific examples. Of yeah, yeah. Of how of of what, uh, how Palestinians. Uh, citizens of Israel are treated uh, mm. unequally under the law, if okay. they are, if they are. Mm. Yeah, in fact, uh, we can provide you with materials about laws, uh, more than, for example, about 34 laws only were passed to disconfiscate lands, for example. You know, for example, one law would say this is for the, conf the confiscation of lands would be would take a place for public purposes. So they take over lands from Arabs. Suddenly you see a Jewish settlement being built on these lands. So we ask the state of Israel, what, so you said for public purposes. So we are not part of the public. And we, if we want to live in these settlements, they wouldn't accept that. And then recently, a law called admission committee, admission, uh, com a committee of admissions. I mean that, for example, every settlement where 400 settlers live, inside the state of Israel, I mean, uh, can't be accepted in this settlement. There are 700 settlements. Why? Because, for example, you know, you hear about the Jewish National Fund. The Jewish National Fund controls 13% of, of land in Israel. This is a semi-governmental organization. It was established before the state of Israel, before the establishment of the state of Israel. And, but it is accorded in power, powers to use the lands only for Jews, explicitly discriminates against Arabs. Arabs can't have access to these lands. Of course, not only to 13%, but to other lands. But this is law was passed recently. This is one of the laws that, was, that were passed recently. Uh, so uh, discrimination in education. For example, I say this is the most, uh, not only in, bu in budget, there is demigration 20, I'm not now going to go in detail about discrimination in budgets and other things, but I'm talking about how things are, how, how, how discrimination in the, in the areas were really very dangerous for a national minority because they wanted, and their policy has been to fragment this uh, uh, minority, to divide it into sectarian groups, religious, groups, Muslims, Christian, uh, Dru uh, 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 Druze. So they wanted to destroy this identity. So the teaching curricula, for example, Jews are allowed to, to learn the history, their history, the history of the Jews, their narrative. But we are denied the right to learn about our narrative, the Palestinian narrative. So this, is, this continues today. I mean, and we have been demanding, we have been fighting for this change, and the state of Israel is not responding to that. Not only that, but recently they have passed a law preventing us from commemorating the Nakba. 
the Palestinian catastrophe in 1948. We are not allowed, but anyway, but today, for example, Palestinians went to their villages, to their destroyed villages. They challenged that, defied that. We continue to defy, to defy that. So, I mean, this is only a small, I mean, any, a few examples of, of discrimination. For that, the example for the education system, I, I was a student in Israel. Two laws, one that for social work students, medical students, or all this profession, you have to be 21 years of age. So that's to allow Jewish to go to the uh, military for three years. Arabs cannot wait three years to go to the school. Another thing is the <coughs> excuse me, uh, scholarships. There are thousands of scholarships that actually um, will be given to people who uh, com uh, complete the, the IDF service. So many students will not be able to get the scholarship for Arab students. Let's go right here first, and then we'll come back to the lady over here. Um, I'd like to add a little something to the discussion here, and then I have a question. And that is also uh, concerning budgets. It's not just for education, but my understanding, it's for social services, for roads, for buildings, permits to uh, build an apart uh, a, uh, a house, or uh, even to get uh, an apartment. Uh, apparently, some places are not open to uh, Israeli Arabs, uh, where there's a great number of Jews living in a particular area. Uh, so maybe you could comment on that. My question is, uh, the uh, program asked the question, and I think it was mentioned during the uh, opening, why is Israel intensifying its policy of political oppression, discrimination, and economic suffocation against the uh, uh, Palestinian minority? Uh, I wonder if you could give your estimate of why they are doing this. Mm. I did get that from the presentation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, in fact, this started 10 years ago. Uh, as I said, bef until 2000, before the outbreak of the first and the second intifada, there was a discriminatory, the systematic discriminatory policy against the Palestinians. But they thought that it would be, this policy was enough to contain them, to tame them, to prevent them from evolving into a coherent national minority with collective demands. What happened, and they thought that the Palestinians, that the policy of severing the cultural roots of the Palestinians and isolating them from the rest of the Palestinian people and from the Arab world, they thought that this policy was successful. They were surprised in 2000 that the Palestinians, especially the young generation, went to the streets, clashed, broke the fear barrier, and they're demanding that they want to be part of the Palestinian people because you are not treating, treating us as equal citizens. The state of Israel, instead of relating or, or, or responding positively to these demands, they thought that this, they are doing this because they are part of the Palestinian enemy. They thought that they opened, that we, Palestinian side, opened another front against the state of Israel uh, with that. But not only that. In fact, the trend of ex right extremism inside of Israel started before that. And the assassination of Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, who signed the actual Oslo Akkad al Arafat, was a result of this extreme, uh, of, of this extremism. The right is growing in the city of Israel, but the Outen Father, in fact, accelerated that. They used an excuse to, to, to crack down on the Palestinians and discriminate against them. So, what they want now? They thought they're almost desperate that those Palestinians would be tamed. So they think now that they should result to other more restrictive or repressive measures so that they can push them outside, they can uh, uh, leave their homeland, part of them at least, and uh, because they can't, for example, uh, because they can't uh, 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 execute ethnic purely ethnic cleansing today, these days, because the world would not allow that. So they are doing that in an in, in indirect way. And uh, the, 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 uh, now they wanted to uh, either you, they are telling us, either you uh, pledge an oath or loyal to the state of Israel, or you go to the Palestinian state, or you leave. And uh, recently, 
Many polls, public polls, show that more than 60% of the Israelis, they want us to be out of Palestine, to be uh, expelled. I mean, uh, and this is very dangerous. So uh, uh, the right government now, the right government, which is ruling in the city of Israel, is why, is it was, why it is confident in itself? Because they are, in fact, supported by the society. So the, all, the, most of the Israeli society is, 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 is getting more extreme. And this is dangerous. And we expect that in the future, in the near future, might be Palestinians would be killed in the street by, by, by Israeli citizens because of this incitement, continued incitement against the Palestinians, against the leaders. And they're always, they, 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 and they try also to uh, uh, drive a wedge between the masses, between the Palestinians and their leaders, and also to drive the wedge among the leaders themselves. They would say about that a moderate, would it say about that about myself or somebody else, an ex extreme. But all of us, in fact, all the Palestinians inside the state of Israel, until recently, they wanted equality, equality in the state of Israel. Now things are changing. They want to change the entire system of the state of Israel. We want more justice, real justice, and we want our, our, our brethren to go back to Palestine. We want justice, of course. We are not turning into racist because Palestinians have always advocated democracy, advocated uh, equality, uh, and, uh, but the state of Israel is becoming more and more uh, Jewish and this and this democratic. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to actually put a quick question to you before we uh, continue uh, based on some of the, the, the things that you mentioned. Um, there are uh, well over uh, a million Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, roughly the same number as Soviet Jewish immigrants uh, into Israel. Um, the Israel Betenu Party, Lieberman's Party, relies very heavily on the Soviet Jewish vote and has become um, uh, an ultra-nationalist party that cannot be ignored by uh, Israeli governments. Um, what are some of the challenges that the Arab community faces in putting together a serious and comprehensive block uh, within uh, Israeli politics? And what uh, is being done to try to overcome some of those divisions? There are now several Arab parties within uh, Israel, and united they could probably be a far more influential force uh, than, than they would be divided. I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective as someone who works uh, with party organizing uh, on this particular oh, question. Okay. Well, in fact, uh, uh, Arab parties in the Knesset are, uh, don't have any uh, influence on the decision-making process in Israel. They are marginalized. They are incited against all the time. But uh, and they can't, uh, even with the, the so-called left, there is no such left in Israel. Because the left in Israel is, has different criteria, has different values, different standards. Because there is consensus in the state of Israel, left and right, they all agree that Israel must be a Jewish state. And I'm saying, I'm, I'm not saying that the cultural, in the cultural meaning. I mean, I'm saying that they want that the privileges be maintained, be reserved for the Jews. This is a fact, must be, I mean, known by everybody. So, in fact, we, uh, when we try to, to, to influence the policy in the state of Israel, not through the Knesset, in fact, but through our struggle, our mass struggle, our, our gra grass, gra grassroots work. This is what we do. But in the Knesset, Arab members of the Knesset, of course, they continue to voice their grievances and to attack the state of the, 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 the Israeli policy towards the Palestinians and support the rights of the Palestinians. But, uh, and they can't achieve or influence uh, uh, the decisions related to crucial matters, uh, the issue of peace, for example, or, 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 uh, uh, or democracy or something like that. So, uh, and the, the, the Soviet bloc, as you say, the Jewish, the, Jewish, the Russian Jews, uh, and, 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 and Lieberman himself, in fact, he speaks for, for Netanyahu. Uh, why, why, why isn't he, I mean, I, uh, firing him, for example? Why? Because, in fact, they both, the, the, the only difference between them is that Lieberman uh, maybe speaks in a, in a way 
that would, I mean, others would say it in a tough way. But in fact, Netanyahu's policy is the same. There is no difference. This is a policy adopted by the Israeli elite. I mean, the policy towards Arabs inside the Green Line and towards, and, uh, towards and the Palestinians in general. Um, one question uh, here. Uh, one group that I don't often hear or hardly ever hear talked about are the Bedouin who um, are really the Bedouin who are in a really terrible situation and I'm just curious about their inclusion in these political movements you know or any other mm. comment you might have about them mm. Yeah, I mean, when I talk about Palestinians and Israel, I include the Bedouins. I mean, there is no difference between, because <laughs> I, I don't differentiate between Bedouin and Christian. And we all Arabs, we all Palestinians. I remember once I was arrested during a demonstration in, in, in some 30 years ago in, in the Naqab when we were protesting against land confiscation. And the interrogator was angry because I'm not Bedouin because what I'm doing there, I'm not Bedouin. So, you know, this is the policy to divide us, to make us feel that there is difference between you know, them. What are the Bedouins? They are Palestinian, they speak Arabic. They live a different, quiet, different style. They are in the north of the country, they are in the south of the country, they are living there. So, I mean, uh, with the same applies, but their, really their situation is much worse, right, than the rest of the Palestinians inside the Green Line, because, uh, I mean, there are many villages which are recognized by the state of Israel, and they are denied basic services, and water, electricity, uh, education, uh, and uh, the, the battle over their land going on. And for example, as maybe because you asked the question, sure you heard about Al Araqib village, which has been destroyed 22 times. Every time we build it, they come and destroy it and they arrest people, they beat people. They, I mean, the, so this is, but, well, is continuing. What we need is thus more support and more backing for this, uh, our struggle. Mm. About the Druze. Ah, yeah, yeah, about the Druze. Yeah, uh, the Druze community, I think this the worst situation, uh, they are living the worst situation. They have been totally isolated, or the purpose was to totally isolate them from the rest of the Palestinians. They are Arabs, they are part of the Islam. But the Israelis, from the very beginning, wanted to them outside totally and impose a Druze culture, what's so called Druze culture, on the schools. So they destroy them totally, destroy their cultural identity to uh, cut off their cultural roots from the rest of the Palestinians and the rest of the Arab world. They imposed compulsory service on them since the 50s. But there have, has been rebellion within them. I mean, many young people, I mean, don't go to the army and they are imprisoned. Hundreds of them have been arrested for a few months each because they don't go to the army. But in fact, they succeeded, the state of Israel succeeded to uh, defame their, or to distort their uh, culture and distort even their positions. They, in fact, they would find people among them who are totally loyal to the state of Israel. And they would even uh, call them Zionists. So, because they were brought up in the schools, in the education that would be directed or geared towards uh, the state of Israel. So, but recently, I mean, there is, is, is a considerable work to uh, change the situation there. There are people operating among the Druze, and also Palestinians help them to uh, uh, get rid of the compulsory service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're starting to run out of time. I know we've got a couple questions left, so what we'll do is we'll take uh, the last three at a time. I know we've got a question coming in from our online audience, so why don't you um, give us that, Steve, and then we'll uh, get this question and a question over here, and then we'll have you respond to the three of them together. Okay. Uh, we have a, a 
viewer watching in Ramallah and uh, wants to know, how do you see the relations between Palestinians living in historic Palestine and Palestinians living in the occupied territories? Since Palestinians in Israel and the occupied territories are facing a similar apartheid regime, do you see a chance for Palestinian CSOs and intellectuals on both sides to join efforts and develop strategies in order to confront the racist Zionist ideology and demand equal rights for all human beings living in this country? So come here uh, and then over there. Uh, obviously, Israel is not responsive, responsive to uh, uh, Palestinian rights and needs in Israel. And going to the Supreme Court didn't help the case of Baram and uh, Akrit. Why don't you consider going to, not just the United Nations, but going to the Human Rights Council, any international uh, gathering, whether in Africa or in South America or in Europe, and present your case openly, uh, eventually, eventually the world will sympathize uh, with the Palestinians and, and will force Israel to give in a little bit. We'll take, we'll take one more over here, and then we'll have you respond. I should remember, remember the question. I'll, I'll, I'll remind, remind you. you. Okay. Uh, do you think the recent uh, development, uh, unity between Hamas and uh, Fatah, will have any impact on Palestinian and Israeli Palestinians? So the question on reconciliation? No then the question on the idea of uh, appealing to international um, forums for justice, and then the question about uh, collaboration between Palestinians living in occupied territories and those yeah, inside yeah, Israel. Yeah, yeah. yeah, with regard to the first question, we are uh, cooperating more than, uh, than before now, uh, given the uh, dramatic changes in the Arab world and also in Palestine. So we are really uh, trying to uh, coordinate our activities and agree on one slogan. Because until recently, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip said that we want to, want to uh, the slogan was to end occupation inside the Green Line, uh, equality, and in the exiled, the right to fraternity. Now we think that there should be one slogan we have not yet agreed on, but must be, I myself, for example, say that there must be to down the Zionist regime or to down the apartheid regime, because uh, the, 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 the Israeli, the state of Israel, and all of Palestine, I mean, is under apartheid regime. Of course, why I'm saying maybe it's more accurate to say that the Zionist regime, because uh, Apartheid is different from that in, in, in Palestine. This is maybe, it's, it's part of the same family. So this is, I mean, in short, I'm saying, because there are details about what we are doing and what we are going to do, but this will take time. And, but uh, anyway, the direction is towards this. With regard to the resulting to the international uh, forums, of course, we have been doing that, in fact. We, and this is what uh, uh, makes Israel angry, uh, because in the last 20 years, we went to commissions, I mean, uh, uh, related to the UN, and we voiced our grievances there. But what we need now is that to go directly to the United Nations, and this is what we are planning to do. So this we, we are, are, are uh, planning to do that, in fact. Uh, the impact of the reconciliation, no doubt that the uh, reconciliation is, is, is mostly needed. And uh, we think this is a good news for us, for Palestinians, all of Palestine, for all, all the Palestinians. And no doubt that, that it will be impact. We hope that it will succeed, we hope, because we are still cautious. But we think that this step is very important after the Arab revolutions. And uh, we, uh, both parties should work hard to uh, implement or to, have, at least because there are uh, still vague points in the agreement that was reached. They should uh, specify that, they should work hard for 
in order to achieve. Of course, the, uh, as you know, uh, the reconciliation came as a result of the uh, Arab revolutions and of course of the also the movements, the youth movement that started in, in Palestine. So this is good news and it will have an impact, no doubt, on the Palestinian struggle. I would thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much.